Today I'm going to show you how to match the colors from one camera to another, and I'm going to try and give you a bunch of useful log grading tips while I'm at it. Let's get undone. Gerald undone. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and where we're going, we don't need roads. So let's not waste any time and jump right into Resolve. Now most of the stuff I'm going to show you can be done in any other NLEs, but Resolve really is the best option when it comes to this stuff, and since the basic version is free, anybody can do this. So first up, let's talk about the problem, which is that commonly, when mixing footage from different cameras, you'll find that they have different skin tones, or just a generally different way of rendering color, even when white balance the same as you can see between these two clips here. So I've got clips here from the Sony FX9 and the Canon C500 Mark II, as well as some other cameras. And keep in mind that these are the cameras that I chose for this test, but this applies to any cameras. They're not specific to this, so any tips that I show you in this video, you can apply to your hybrid mirrorless cameras, to your other cine cameras, really anything. It's just about color, so it's gonna apply across the board. But for these two, the Sony FX9, if you look at the skin tones here and look at the colors even on the board, you can see that it goes from kind of an orangier with a bit more green and, and teal in the grays to a much rosier gray and a definitely more magenta skin tone. If we look at the white balance here, which in Resolve, by the way, if you right click anytime that you're using your dropper tool, you can choose show picker RGB value. And this will help you know if something is white balanced correctly because you can see if your red, green, and blue are all the same number, then obviously you don't have a bias toward any one color. And so our gray here is very neutral. We have 219, 218, 218. So that's very, very good. And if we look at the Sony, same thing. Let's look for when we have the white balance card here. 220, 220, 220. So they're both perfectly white balanced, yet somehow the Canon looks like that and the Sony looks like that. And that's basically that these these cameras have a have an intention behind how they want things to look and this is the way that they render color and just white balancing isn't enough. Now there's a few systems in place to deal with this. You could use something called ACES which was designed almost exactly for this purpose to create an accuracy standard for different camera brands and while it definitely helps the results vary depending on the camera and the profile you're transforming. Some work well, some don't. Let me show you what I mean. So here's the two clips again using an ACES transform. We've got the Sony FX9 and the Canon C500 Mark II. And for Canon, we're using the C-Log2 to Cinema to Rec. 709 using ACES 1.1. And for the FX9, we're using the Sony S-Log3 S Gamut 3 Cine, which is how we shot it, to Rec. 709. And again, you can still see that the Canon is more magenta and the Sony is kind of more orangey. Now, it definitely helps on the waveform if we look here and we look at the general exposure and compare the two there, we can see that we're getting very similar results in the waveform, but the colors are different. So this is one of those things where whoever makes the ACES transforms, if they don't make them, if the same person's not making them to look exactly the same with the colors, they're not going to fix the skin tone matching between different cameras. So another option is to use LUTs that are designed for camera matching. The Leeming LUTs are a great example of this and generally do a pretty great job at creating a consistent look camera to camera. But most LUTs out there don't do this. For example, if you acquire the LUTs from the manufacturer to convert your log footage, those LUTs are still based on the same color biases of the camera brand. So they aren't going to get your Sony camera to look like Canon or to even look like some neutral standard. They're going to convert an unfinished Canon look to a more finished Canon look with the same color preferences. Here's an example of that. Okay, so here's those same two clips again. Here is the Sony and here is the Canon. And I have more contrast added, but you can still see the same difference again. The Sony has the more orangey skin tones and the Canon has the more magenta ones. And if we look at what we're doing here, instead of the Aces Transform, we're using a LUT. And for the Canon one, we're using the Canon C-Log2 to BT709 wide dynamic range, which comes from Canon. And for the Sony one, we're using the official S-Log3 LUT, the S Gamut 3 Cine S-Log3 to 709. So both of these ones come from the manufacturer, and they do a great job of finishing to get that 709 look of each respective camera brand. But again, they're not giving you some neutral or ability to match. But one way that you can kind of combine the last two ideas is to use a transform to convert your camera into another camera and then use the LUT from that camera instead. This is commonly done with the Ari Alexa. People will convert their Sony or Canon footage to Alexa, then use the Alexa LUT. This can have a really pleasing result, but it still faces the same problem that if the Alexa conversions weren't all done by the same person with the same color intentions, they'll probably look a little different. However, from any of these starting points, whether grading from scratch or after applying an ACES transform or a manufacturer LUT, you can still add another step to color match those cameras. But first, 
I'd like to take a minute to thank Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. Storyblocks makes it possible for me to make tutorials like this for free for you guys. And they also offer an impressive collection of stock footage covering a wide range of subjects with unlimited downloads and 4K video. They're amply supplied with backgrounds, overlays, and After Effects templates, and the interface is easy to use and navigate, and the clips are royalty free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic library of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. All right, so color matching your cameras is much easier to do if you have a color checker and some spare time, because before going out to shoot, you can make your own LUTs based on your specific shooting situation, and this will allow you to take your time and dial it in just right, and then save time later when editing your actual project. But color checkers can also be used on a real shoot by just placing them in the frame for a second or two when you start to roll, and then using them as a reference for correcting your footage later on. But of course, I'll also show you how to evaluate and correct skin tones when you don't have a color checker in the shot. But first, since so many of you asked on Twitter, let's start with correcting using a color checker. So we're going to switch our scope over to the vector scope so that we can see some things. And in this shot, I obviously I'm holding a color checker, but you can have it just sort of like in the frame, you have a talent holding it, if there's no person in the shot, you could put it on a little light stand or something, whatever, in order to be able to see it in the frame. And I've got a bunch of other things going on here right now, lots of nodes, you know, exposure, I've got the LUT that I was telling you about, the Sony LUT, and then the Canon LUT, I've also put a white balance on there. I'll go over the workflow at the end, sort of like a complete thing, but for now, let's just focus on correcting color using hue and saturation curves and the color checker. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over to the hue versus hue here. And this is a curve that changes the hue position of all of our different colors. And if you look over here on the vector scope, as I raise the line, you can see that it rotates around. And this is useful if you need to make just a slight rotation due to a bias of the camera. But if we need to refine the colors individually, then the best way to go about that is to add points. And Resolve makes this easy for you by just adding some shortcut buttons here that will add all the relative points to these points on the vector scope. And so let's just start, and if we raise the red, you can see how it swings that red around. So we'll just line it up with the red box, and we'll line up the yellow one. We're just aiming for to be about the middle of the box there. And we'll move this until the green one goes in, and the same with the cyan, and the blue. Now some of these are going to be too short, and some of them are going to be too long, but we'll address that with saturation in a minute. So there, once we have them mostly lined up, we'll switch over to saturation, and we'll do the same thing. We can hit the shortcut buttons here, and then we can lower the red to bring that into the box. And our magenta is pretty much already in the box. Same with our blues, pretty good. We'll just lower it a little bit. And cyan down, and green is pretty good, and then yellow down. So now we have each color in its respective box, and if we look at the image, it's very neutral. It's a bit undersaturated, but it's completely neutral. If we raise the saturation, then you can see it sort of come back to life, and you can dial in the saturation to taste, and then you have a pretty balanced image. And if we were to do the same thing on the Canon, we should get a very similar result. So I'm going to jump over to the Canon, I'm going to do the exact same thing, just sort of a speedy version of it. Okay, so now I did the same thing with the Canon, and if we jump back and forth between the Canon and the Sony, we can see that they're a lot more similar now. Again, both are quite desaturated, and the Canon does still have its sort of overall rosiness to it, where the Sony has a little bit more of that, you know, green in the, in the grays and a little bit more of an orangey to the skin tone. And I'm going to address that now by showing you how to correct for skin tones, and you can do this even if you didn't have a color checker in the shot. So I'm going to bump the saturation like I said I would on each of them. Let's just put them to 60 so that we can see. We'll go a little bit higher actually. We'll go all the way up to 65. There. So each one of them is more saturated now. So if we zoom into my face here, we can really see their differences in how they render skin. And this would be an example of if you didn't have a color checker in the shop, but you wanted to know how to correct skin tones just naturally. Let's say that we wanted the Canon to match the Sony. Well, what we want to do if we didn't have the color chart, because then we wouldn't be able to see these points, we still would see this little blurb here, which is your skin tone. And if we look at the Sony, we can see the skin tone here. And they're close, but the Canon is a little bit more off to the red side, the more magenta side, which is over here, and the Sony is more toward the yellow side. So to fix that, what we need to do, is I have a new node that I'm calling Refine. You don't need to do this, but I'm just doing it in addition to our previous hue and saturation curve so we can see it stack on top of each other. But we would take this and we would create a skin tone zone. So if you look at this, this chunk right here that's in the reds, this is my face. I just know this, but if you look at the frame, it makes sense that this is the red thing in the frame, and then this big chunk here would be the purple background. And if we look at the Sony, we can see that not only is the red thing more to the right, it's more to the orange, 
but it also reaches to just above this line where the cannon is a little bit lower maybe. So the cannon is more on the red magenta side and not quite as saturated. So that gives us a, a clue as to what we have to do. But even if you didn't have anything to compare it to, you can just look at the shot and say, this is more magenta than I want it to be. And if that's the case, then we'll put a point just past the yellow line here, which is gonna be the green. You have to be careful with resolve though, because often when you click on it, it actually shifts it, and I wish it didn't. Now if we click just above where my face is, now we can adjust it. If we move it up, obviously I turned really purple, and if I bring it down, I turn really green. So we want to add a little bit more green to undo the magenta of my face. So if I just drag this down just a few points, so that was a minus 5. Minus 50 would look something like this, so that's an extreme change. Usually only like 5 points is all you really need. So that's a minus 5. And if we compare it to Sony again, we're getting a little bit closer. In fact, if anything, I would say now we've overcorrected on the Canon. So let's try something more like a minus three and just quickly jump back and forth. So that's a lot closer. But again, you can see the Sony's a bit more saturated. So now on the Canon, we're gonna jump to our hue versus saturation and we're gonna put similar points. One just past the yellow, Make, set that back to one. That's neutral for the saturation. And one probably about halfway between the red and the magenta. We don't wanna go too far into the magenta because then we're gonna affect the background. Just click about here. Reset that to one. And then again, click just above the mound here, which is our skin tone. And then we can bump it up just a little bit. It'll give you an idea. That's an extreme version. That's 1.75. Two is at the top. And this is a little bit of like 1.09. Now we'll add maybe like 1.05 saturation. And now let's compare that to the Sony. And they're looking pretty close now. I'm not gonna go much further than this because you get the idea. You can dial it in and refine it. But this is, if we just look at my face here back and forth, we can see they're very, very similar. And now we can zoom back out. And we did that without even looking at the color checker. So you can still correct skin tones without looking at the color checker. Now the purple in the background, you'll notice is a little bit different. And it's the exact same procedure. If we look at the Canon, we have this big purple chunk here, and we can see sort of how far to the left it is from the magenta line. And if we look at the Sony, we can see that it's on the right side of the magenta line, which means that if we wanted the Canon to match, we'd have to do a very similar procedure. For the hue versus hue, we'd want to click maybe just to the right of the blue line, and again, reset that to zero, and then click here. And if we shift it up, it's going to go more blue, and if we shift it down, it's going to go more on the purple side of things and we can just dial it in until it looks right or more right like the other one. And it also looks more saturated to me. Uh, so if we switch over to the hue versus saturation, again, put a line just this side of blue, and then we can drag this down until it becomes a little bit less saturated. And now if we flick back and forth, those purples are a lot closer. And we just did this completely by eye. We looked at it and thought, that purple's not right, it's more blue. Well, let's make it more red. And it's that simple. You just basically have to know which direction you're going. And you can experiment just by moving it up and down. The trick is to isolate the zone that you want to control by those dots. But don't make too many dots and don't make them extreme because then you're going to do something where the color, just there isn't enough adequate information to shift such an extreme. I can show you this with the purple sort of around my face here. If I make some pretty extreme dots here and raise this one up and then raise this one down and bring this one really tight and you look at this, it, it's too extreme of changes and it completely falls apart. So you want to make sure that any adjustments that you make are gradual and roll off nicely. So that's how you can use a color checker to get accurate color or to change colors. But if you aren't using a starting transform or LUT from the manufacturer, you'll probably also need to match the Luma curve. So let me show you my favorite way to do that. Okay, so I want you to look at these two clips here. This is Sony using the official manufacturer LUT that we talked about earlier. And this is one that I made. Now, I could have done a little bit better on the purple, but I just think overall, if you look at the exposure and the way that the highlights roll off, it's pretty close. And the colors are pretty close as well. And this is what we're talking about here when we talk about the Luma curve. So if we look at the waveform and I bounce back and forth, you can see the waveform is pretty close. I probably should make some refinements, but I'm just gonna quickly show you how to achieve that. So what we need to do is I have this first note here called exposure. And if you're not shooting raw, this is what I would do to correct a log image that obviously your, <laughs> your, your situation here is way too compressed to get any kind of image like this out of it. Now on this one, I'm gonna turn off the contrast to get a sense of what the LUT is doing. If I take the LUT away, you can see that's how the log image was shot. And then if I put the LUT on, that's what it did. So what we need to do is turn this into this 
but without a lot we need to do it with our curve. And this is another point where the color checker comes in handy because we have our bars here that give us clean lines on the waveform. And there's sort of a shortcut that you can kind of remember here, which is to set the different bars to certain points quickly using the curve. If we look at this one for reference, the white is up at around the 90% line here, the 18% gray is around the 50% point, and then our darker gray is around 30%, and then the black line is down here on this line. And we can do this rather easily. First, I would suggest grabbing a point and raising it up as you move up and to the right until the line, that the top line, the white line, hits around the 90% point. And then we're going to need to put another line to move the bottom ones down to about where they were. So remember the other one was just above that 256 line. So something like this, this one on this line and this on this point. And now we just have to change it a little bit to get the midline a little bit lower, which is basically how the curve is going to pivot here. So if we just click somewhere in the middle and just bring that down until that's around the 50% line, and then we can just kind of finesse this curve a little bit. Because again, you don't want to put these kind of crazy sharp bends in it, because you can see what it's doing to my skin. It's, it's bad news. So we're going to smooth that out and try and get a nice rounded curve while still achieving those lines where we can. And then now if we pop the contrast back on and look at this shot and compare it to this shot with the contrast on, we can see that we get a pretty similar result. Now this one has a bit more contrast of a curve. So again, you can go and refine that. If you raise this up, it's gonna illuminate that side of my face there. If you lower this one down, it's going to smooth out the highlights on the side. And this is up to your taste, because if you're not using a LUT, you can do whatever you want and design the type of curve that you think is nice for you. But you can see that we get a pretty pretty similar idea really quickly. And this is an important step to do when it comes to replacing LUTs manually because a big part of LUTs is usually correcting the log curve and as well correcting the color. It usually does both of those things for you. So if you're going to do it manually, you need to correct the color like I showed you, but also fix your exposure curves so that everything kind of falls in place. But now we can put everything that we learned here together in this video and grade a log shot from scratch without using any LUT, but still create a color accurate image with a nice curve. So for this clip, I'm actually going to reset all of our node grades here. And this will tell you a little bit about the order. Actually, I'm not going to reset that last one because that's my specific grade that it just gives me a little bit more purple in the shot. I can show you what it does on this one if I turn it off and on. I just like it. So for the finished look, I'm going to leave that one on, but it's not part of the workflow. These five nodes are the ones that we're going to want for this workflow. And I'm going to explain that to you right now. So since we're not using a LUT or any kind of color correction, this isn't a LUT anymore. This is going to be more like saturation, which is a key part of a LUT. Usually a LUT adds a certain amount of saturation as well. So first we're going to get the exposure right, and we're not going to match this to any shot now. We're just going to do it based on the principles that I showed you to show you how you can do it if you're not trying to match a camera, but you're just trying to make a nice look from scratch, because I promised you log grading tips. So we're going to do that same thing that I just explained. We're going to use this to bump up the line on the waveform until we hit around that 90% point. Then we're going to put another one down here, and we're going to bring it down to... Eh, about here where it just sits just above around 300 if you're using 10 bit and then the the black will sit right around the 128 for now and then again we're going to sort of finesse this curve to put that one around to put the mid middle point around 50 percent and also you'll notice that if we slide it up and down we change where the skin tones fall relative to the middle so we want to try and find one that looks nice but we can always fix this afterwards when we have saturation and contrast so i'm just going to go with something like this it looks like a pretty reasonable s curve now we're going to move on to white balance now generally you might find it easier to white balance with more saturation but i find the resolve does a pretty good job so this color checker this is the color checker video it has a big white balance target on the opposite side of the color checker it's pretty handy for this so so we can just use our automatic white balance if we want by clicking on this dropper down in the bottom corner. Let me put this on two so we can see our temperature and tint. And we'll put this right in the middle there and click on it. And like I showed you before, your dropper should look somewhat even pretty much wherever you put it. So 182, 181, 182, that's a pretty good white balance. So now we're white balanced. Now we need saturation. I found that most logs need, in Resolve anyway, for you to bump the saturation from 50, which is its default, up to around 85. You might want 83, 87, 90, but somewhere around there. I'm gonna do 85 as just kind of a baseline. Now we've got our saturation, and now we'll add some contrast. Now I can just tell you the type of contrast that I like, but again, this is up to you. We're just doing this to taste. I like to put the pivot around 0.6 and that's based on how fair I am. I'll show you what the pivot does in a second though. So let's bump the contrast up 
to taste. So we'll just increase it till I think it looks reasonable. Now look what happens if I lower the pivot on my skin versus say the dark shirt that I'm wearing. If I lower the pivot, my skin gets really bright and washed out. And if I raise the pivot, my skin gets really dark and other parts of the image kind of even out. So it, it basically depends how extreme you want the contrast, how, how, how sharp you want your S curve to be. So I found that around 0.6 gives a reasonable result. Now we're going to do that color correcting aspect and we have plenty of saturation to work with. So we're going to switch to the vector scope and I'm going to scrub back to the beginning so I can see all my colors on the color chart. But even without using the color checker, if we just look at my skin here, I would say that looking at it, I look a little bit orange and a little bit oversaturated in my face. So if I were to do that manually without a color checker, I would go to my hue and hue curve and I would click again where I showed you before a little bit past there and a little bit just closer to the magenta side of the red and then I would click on the bump that's for my skin tone and if we raised it up a little bit we would eliminate some of that yellow and get a little bit more on the magenta side and then I would jump over to the hue versus saturation put similar points and I would lower the saturation a little bit on my skin and then if we zoom out I feel like that's a nicer skin tone and I did that without actually looking at the vector scope or the color checker. But let's use the vector scope and let's use our color checker since we have it. So I'm just going to reset these things and then I'm going to add all the points back using the shortcuts for both hue versus hue and hue versus saturation. Now there's also hue versus luma which we didn't really talk about that much and that's if you happen to be comparing shots with other color checkers or you know that your points here are too bright you could do something like this and lower we look at say just this magenta point here you could look at this chip and say oh that chip is way too bright up there and we would lower it down you're seeing that blocking because my points are too close together but you can affect your, your luma that way i find that it's not as commonly needed in most cases but it's something you might need to do if you do find that one of your color chips is a little bit out of whack with the particular camera you're shooting on but anyway we've got our hue versus hue and our hue versus saturation and we're going to do something similar to what i showed you before so we're going to start with the hues and we're just going to pull these in until they line up more closely with the squares because we're not trying to match to any specific camera so we'll just try and get pretty accurate color out of this thing so we'll put our all of our dots so they line up with the targets over here on the vector scope and then we'll go to the saturation and we'll lower this down raise up the magenta lower the blue raise up the cyan and you can see that you can do this pretty quickly once you sort of get the hang of it and then lower the red or the yellow and then just sort of finesse the red a little bit. So if we look at ourselves here, we're a little bit too magenta and we're a little bit undersaturated. So I'm going to go back to our previous saturation node and I'm going to increase it now to taste. So I'm just going to bump it up just a little bit until I like what I see on my skin there. Nothing too crazy. And then like I said, back over here on the HSL, now we can make the image less accurate in order to make the skin tones what we like. And let's use that same principle before. So if I look at these skin tones, to me, they look a little bit magenta, a little bit purple. And if we look at this big blob here on the vector scope, which is my particular skin tone, it definitely is not falling on the line or as close to the line as I would like. So that's a hue versus hue issue. And we're going to use our red point here and we're going to bring it down and so that it falls a little bit more on the line. And we're going to do this to taste, but also using our scopes. Our scopes let us know if we're close to the skin tone line, but we can look at the image ourselves and decide how, you know, how, what kind of balance between accuracy and pleasing that we like. And I would say that something around here is pretty good. So what I like to do at this point is then go ahead and check our white balance again, just to make sure that all the stuff that we did to color didn't really contaminate our neutrals, because it's important that we still keep our neutrals free from any bias. So if we look here, 205, 204, 206, 205, 203, 205, it looks like we need just a little bit more green in the shot and a little bit less blue. So we can go back to our white balance and just maybe fix that a little bit. So our temperature is 179. Let's bump that up to 190 and our tint is 23. Let's drop that down to 20. Let's check this out here. 203, 204, 203. So now apparently we've got a little bit too much green. So we'll try 21 on the tint. And 204, 204, 204. So now we got a good result there. The tint, the higher you go up with it, the more magenta it gets, and the temperature, the higher you go up with it, the more warm it gets. Okay, and now I think that we have a pretty good little image here. And now we can go back to our contrast if we want, and we can finesse this a little bit. So if we wanted a little bit more contrast maybe, and adjust the pivot to you know, pull it into our skin. And we can also go back to our exposure tab 
and monkey with the curve a little bit if we wanted to, let me put it back to the bars, if we wanted to maybe, you know, change the way that it, the highlights roll off on our skin there. So we can, you can do this to taste, I'm not going to spend too long on it, but let's just take a look. And that's pretty smooth. We're lacking a little bit of punch in the upper register there, so maybe we might want to bump this up just to bring a little bit of life into the skin. And that's pretty good. And we did that completely from scratch with no LUT, no shot to compare it to. And if you've created this look that you like, you could save this as a LUT, and you can do this in Resolve quite easily. If you right click on this here on the actual clip, then you have the option to generate a 3D LUT, 33 point or 65 point. 33 points are good if you're going to use them for monitoring because you can use them for your Atomos or in-camera in monitoring LUTs. And 65 point is good if you want to use it to actually grade your footage because you could export this as a LUT, use it on one of your other NLEs if you prefer to edit in Premiere or Final Cut but you wanted to do the color in Resolve, you can export the LUT and then edit the footage and now you just have that LUT and anytime that you're going to use this shot you can use it. However, if you're going to want to apply this to different clips and different shots and you just want to make your workflow a little bit easier, it's better instead to right click on the image and choose grab still and this will move it over here into your gallery and then you could label it like uh, you know in this case I think this was an FX9 so we call this FX9 studio grade or something I spelled studio with two T's and then now the next time that we want to edit a clip so let's jump back to this one and I'll reset this completely, say this was a fresh shot, we can right click on the still and choose apply grade, and not only does it have the same effect of a LUT in that we get the finished image, but we still have all of our nodes that we can then tweak. So I think that's it. Keep in mind that this is something that takes practice to get good and fast at, and to develop a sense of knowing what needs to be done with less experimentation. But if you're just starting out with color, embrace that experimentation, because that's how you'll learn the most. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining, or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. Alright, I'm done.